Okay, so... A f Hang on a minute, where, where, what was it? March, wasn't it? March? When did we do our last? March. Okay, so early March, um, we were privileged enough to, to speak to the legend that is Mr. Anthony Peake. Um, just before we went into lockdown, we shot the, uh, the bulk of the interview with him, um, but then obviously the, the virus situation took over and we weren't able to finish it. So we are now here to finish it off. Uh, so please welcome Mr. Anthony Peake. From uh, background from Anthony. Yeah. Okay, so yes, we're here with Anthony. Anthony, would you mind giving our viewers uh, a little background about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, well, originally from the Wirral, in the northwest of England. Um, and when I was 12 years of age, I had a bout of double pneumonia. And I had a series, during the crisis of pneumonia, I had a series of very, very powerful hallucinations. And these were so intrigued me because they seemed to be like I was seeing an alternate reality. And I was so keen on this that after that, I started reading up considerably a great amount of material about hallucinations, human consciousness, and everything else. Uh, and uh, from there on, I decided that when I had the opportunity to go to university, that I would study basically sociology, sociology of language, sociology of religion, and the sociology of belief. And it was from there that my real interest then developed, and I've been reading around the subject now for more than half a century. Okay, so big question, big starter, Anthony. Um, what I'd like to know is what you or your knowledge around what consciousness is. Wow, that is a huge question, isn't it? And one of the questions that philosophers and scientists and researchers have been thinking about for centuries. You know, what is it when to say that I am conscious? What is going on here? You know, inside my head is electrical signals reacting with chemicals inside my brain. And yet that all creates me, creates my hopes, my dreams, my memories, my anticipations. It creates internally uh, an observer that seems to observe external reality. It is simply impossible. And in fact, in 1999, at a conference at the University of Arizona, a young uh, Australian philosopher by the name of David Chalmers stood up and shocked everybody because he asked the question. And he said, there are two questions that modern science has to address. There's the easy problem of science, which is, how the brain works and functions, which we can do by analysing the brain. But the real hard problem of consciousness is how does inanimate matter reacting with electricity create all those things? You know, for instance, you're observing this world around you now. You're thinking about it and everything else. But where is the point that that is created? And what indeed, what happens to that when we die? As well? yeah. listened to a podcast of yours recently which was you spoke about the worms where they removed the head and the tail um, and those worms have been trained to go to light to receive the best food that they could get which I believe was liver and uh, once they grew their head back or whatever it was they were they were able to remember that they would find that best quality food within that light which is something they didn't want to go to so we're, what we're saying there is is there's memory outside of the actual brain, which is in conflict with what the scientists tell us. Well, there's been this ongoing problem with memory. And for many, many years, researchers have been trying to find the location of memory in the brain. Yeah. And there was a guy many years ago um, who did a series of experiments with rats where they cut sections of the rat's brain out but they could never find where the memory was located. So this was a great mystery. And when they then discovered the curiosity of the planaria worms, whereby you can train these worms to overcome their fear of light, 
and train them and tell them that effectively that within direct sunlight there is liver, which they particularly like. Then they took the culinary worms, cut their heads off and allowed new brains to grow. But when the new brains grew, the culinary worm remembered and, over, and still did have, uh, con continued to have that overcoming of the fear of light. Now, as you say, the question is here, how can that be possible? Unless memory is contained somewhere else or memory is a field around us. Because, for instance, they've never really been able to find lots of things that happen in the brain that are mysteries, like the feeling we have that everything is happening now. Simultaneity, it's called the binding problem. Okay. It's the idea of where does it all come together in the brain? And they've never been able to find it. So consciousness and awareness is a huge mystery. For example, is the we're now seeing this beautiful wood and we're, we're hearing the wind in the trees and we're feeling, feeling the cold around us. But these are all things known as qualia. They don't exist in the external world. For instance, pain. Pain doesn't actually exist as anything other than a sensation. But if there's nothing around to feel the sensation, how can you ever say that something is externally real? You know, for instance, if there were no sentient beings on the world, in the world, or in fact no animals or anything else, pain would not be there. tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it actually make a sound? I think that's what both people are saying about that. The, 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 the part of consciousness upon this reality, I suppose, and we're going into the wave part called Schrodinger, that type thing, isn't it? Um, if there's nothing, or well, consciousness has effect on this reality, is that correct? Or Well, we... there, is, there is growing evidence, and there has been evidence since the 1930s, that the act of observation or the act of measurement brings about the existence of subatomic particles. Yes. And before a subatomic particle is measured, it can be statistically anywhere in the universe. And indeed, Max Born in 1926, <coughs> Max Born, who incidentally, as a, as a piece of nonsensical pieces of information, was I think the grandfather or great grandfather of other than Newton John. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, he argued that when we talk about the wave function in terms of subatomic particles, we're not talking about waves as in water or sound waves. We're talking about literally a statistical wave function, rather like, you know, when you, 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 when you do your statistics and you do curves and, and okay. everything else in terms of... On a graph. On a graph, yeah. yeah. You know, it's the area under a curve and how it's calculated. And that wave function is a mathematical function. And in fact, you mentioned Schrodinger earlier on, and it was Schrodinger that put the mathematical format of this and put it onto a mathematical structure. But it means that there's a direct relationship between what we observe and what is out there. And of course, we know that sometimes it seems that our own thoughts seem to manipulate the world around us. You know, we can make things happen by the power of thought. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so we were, yes, consciousness and how that affects reality, and I suppose the next question to bring you around to would be simulation theory and how that's, um, how we're tending to go down this path now of reality being a simulation. I think it's a really fascinating point here. When we use the term simulation, it begs certain questions because a simulation effectively means it's a simulation of something else. Okay. And of course, the big question is, if this is a simulation, what is it a simulation of? And I prefer to use the term, I don't know, just a digital reality. Yeah. Because simulation, you know, people get a bit confused by that. And I think that's, once we start thinking along those terms, everything starts to make more sense. Because to me, there are certain things about reality that don't make sense. You know, it's like synchronicities. 
Harper, you know, chance meetings, these kind of things. It's as if, in some way, either we have lived this life before, or it's planned out in some way. Okay. Now, of course, that's suggesting that there's a plan. But if it was a simulation, then things would be planned within the simulation. And it would explain where consciousness lies. Because, of course, consciousness, we are part of a greater something. Um, I contributed a chapter to a book many years ago on a concept called pandeism. Okay. Which is the idea that, effectively, we are all one singular consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. Right. You know, as uh, Bill Hicks said in his famous monologue many years ago. And the idea is that, at a deeper level, we are all one. Everything is one. And, of course, that's what holography is about and holograms. Yeah. Um, which is interesting because I think, and I'll and I pick this up from, uh, from reading some of the stuff that's written about you, especially on Wiki, and I'd never, I'd never heard of uh, pandeism before. Is that the correct term? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, which was quite unique for me because um, on some of the experiences that I've had in the DMT realm or some of the information that I felt has been given to me, it started me off on this journey, and I think I mentioned it in some previous videos. So I didn't, I, I never knew about the Fibonacci cycle, and that was kind of something that we formulated out of the same information about the oneness um, and this pandeism. And it was like this: I'd go to bed at night just thinking about what I'd, what I'd seen or what I'd been given. So then, when I read about this stuff, the, the, the theory, pandeism theory, I was like, hello. hello. That's what I was told, or that information was put forward to me, and I'd never heard of it. I mean, one of the things that fascinated me many years ago was when I came across the work of the Anglo-American physicist, uh, David Bohm. And David Bohm was a student of Einstein and always had a problem with the idea of this observer viewpoint of reality that we were discussing before. And he believed that there's a much deeper level of reality. And then that deeper level of reality, everything is related to everything else. And I remember many years ago, it was quite fascinating, I did a, um, a talk at the National Theatre before a production of J.B. Priestley's play Time and Conways. I did a platform event and the person I was talking with or doing the event with was Professor Je Jeff Forshaw okay. who was the PhD tutor for Brian Cox and in fact Coxie and, and uh, Forshaw have written books together. Right. And just over coffee at the University of Manchester's Department of Physics Jeff just turned around to me and said of course we know that every electron in the universe knows the location of every other electron. And that's an incredibly powerful statement from one of the major researchers in the subject. Because it means that a subject known as um, superposition and non-locality is a reality, a real part of the universe. That in some deeper level, everything is related, just like the parts of a hologram are related. So for instance, if you take a holographic image and you smash it, You'd expect it to be rather like a jigsaw puzzle, that every piece would be part of the overall picture. But with a holographic image, it's not. Every piece of the image is a denuded version of the whole picture. So the whole is, is in the parts, and the parts are in the whole. Okay, yeah. And of course, this is what they believe the universe is really like. It's almost like those nested Russian dolls. Right. You know, so as I said in one of my books, it means that the Andromeda galaxy is probably in a tear in your eye. <laughs> And this means that we are a we're part of a greater something, and we're just emanations of it, rather like waves on an ocean. When you said the uh, den denoted, the holograph deluded, yeah, deluded, denuded. What, yeah, what, what does that? So explain to me what that means, because I'm getting this, I'm getting this idea in my head. You shatter a hologram, and you you could look into that hologram and see exactly what was in the whole hologram. Correct. So every piece has a kind of a, a less less sharp image of the whole. So if you had a picture right, of, okay. say, I don't know, a tree, yeah. and you smashed it up, 
each piece would actually show the tree. The tree. Rather than the parts of the tree. But less resolution. But less resolution. Wow. Now, that is intriguing because, as David Bohm then said, does it mean that at a deeper level there is something, and he called it the implicate and explicate orders. There's the implicate order which is inside, and the explicate order is everything that we perceive as this reality. And this reality is far more interesting than everything we've been to understand. And now they're starting to discover the holographic nature of the universe, and it's all to do with black holes. Okay. Quite intriguing stuff. It's the idea that, in, for instance, if the universe is an enclosed system, so you imagine that the universe, well, let's look at it, universe Big Bang starts expanding outwards. Yeah. The question is, there's nothing really outside of the expansion of the universe. Okay. okay. Yeah. So if I then go to a black hole and I take, I don't know, um, my mobile phone yeah. and I throw my mobile phone into the, into the black hole, mm -hmm. Effectively, what has happened there is information has been lost because effectively, once something goes into black hole, it's supposed to be totally destroyed. Yeah. The question is that this contravenes the second law of thermodynamics because information is found to, is, has been found to have physical, it's a physical thing. Okay. And it's lost. And that should not happen. That shouldn't happen in the laws of physics. With the laws of physics. So Stephen Hawking did some calculations towards the last few, last few years of his life and came up with um, evidence that there's something called Hawking radiation, which, okay. is, which is a form of radiation that's given off by black holes. Right. Which means that the information that is lost when something's sucked into a black hole, in fact, is smeared along the edge of the black hole. Is that on the, the event horizon? On the event horizon, on the Schwarzschild radius. Yeah. And effectively, it's spread out. And not only this, but they argue that, and this gets really quite complex, but if you imagine the Big Bang, it expands outwards. It's like a huge sphere. It's like a, an inflatable balloon. Yeah. And they, they've suggested that the inner edge of the universe, okay. there are tiny little squares yeah. of Planck length size, which is the smallest thing you can get. And each one of them contains one bit of information. Okay. They've done the calculation and suggested that if you calculated the number of bits of information available on the, uh, in the inside of the sphere, yeah. and then you calculated the amount of information needed to create this simulation, they're the same number. It's the same number. And actually, if you think, see, we're thinking of the universe expanding in space, but we're within the reality that observes the space. But yeah. on the outside, if that's the bit information, say that was a computer program and that's all the information, the space is what's perceived inside, but actually there is no space. Yes, there you is one space. So you know, all exactly. of that stuff is actually connected as one, but because we're in this reality and we're perceiving it, we perceive space of the universe. Exactly, and you hit the nail on the head there because the big question, even from years ago, people like Mark, the German, the German philosopher, um, scientist, and he made this wonderful question and he said, what is space? Space is literally the receptacle, as Newton said, that holds everything. But Max said no, because if there was only two objects in the universe, the space is only the, between the two objects. If one, unit, one object disappears, where does space go? Because space... It's unmeasurable, isn't it's it? It's unmeasurable. Space doesn't, have, space doesn't have anything. And if there's nothing physically inside space, does space exist? And these questions are huge philosophical questions. Yeah. And they, they're also coming to conclude now that this is some form of digital simulation whether it's been created or whether this is the true nature of reality, is that the universe is probably two-dimensional. There was a fascinating article, I think written about 10 or 15 years ago, the headlines and the cover of Scientific American, are we living in a hologram? And researchers are still working on this. There's Juan Maldacana, uh, there is the, the, an Israeli scientist called Jacob Beckenstein, who died last year. I think it was last year or the year before, who had been doing research on this, and a guy called Craig Hogan at the Perimeter Institute in Ontario in Canada. And they're trying to find the pixelation of space. They're trying to find the pixelation of this reality. Right. So there's more and more evidence that this is not what it seems. It seems to be our consciousness creates this kind of three-dimensional idea that you can walk into space. Yeah. But it's no different to virtual reality, is it? Which is, again, uh, the consciousness affecting what we perceive and, and, and that thing that we, you know, that whole Which part comes we back, discussing. doesn't it, yeah. to your point before about DMT. Yes. When you go into the DMT zone, it has three-dimensional space. It has a feeling of reality that's more real than this reality. Five-dimensional. 
<laughs> eight dimensional. <laughs> multi dimensional. Multi dimensional. Multi dimensional, yeah, definitely. And it's, it seems to be an emanation of us, but not. And it's more real. I mean, I've never taken it, but I'm told by individuals that have that the reality you go to is an even greater reality than this one. Yeah. Some, the clarity sometimes, for definite, yeah. But it feels it's more, it's more real. It's more real. It's more real, yeah. It feels more, when you come out of that state, this feels like the charade. Right. That yeah. feels like the engine room behind And it's also, this. there's almost like a, rec- a, a recognition or a recollection. Yeah, familiarity. Like, hello. Fam- yeah, the familiarity. Many yeah, years ago, there's a friend of mine, Tony, who was one of my friends in Liverpool, and he took DMT for the first time, and he said he felt like he shot out of his body super fast, and he ends up somewhere else. And he, I remember him saying, and it still disturbs me now, he said, oh my God, I'm back there again. You know, as you say, there's this kind of recognition that this, this is my natural habitat. This is the, this is the dream. This is, yeah, exactly. And Definitely. we go out of the dream into, and I think the analogy of the mechanism is good. It's almost mm. like, you know, uh, the end of the Truman Show, where mm. he gets to the end and yeah. he looks round. Or that famous, you know, there's a very famous painting from medieval period with this guy, and he's, he's actually put his head through the edge of the universe and mm. he's looking through. Okay. And he sees all the mechanisms behind. Right. And I think probably DMT probably does that. It, it opens definitely. up yeah. our inner eye. Yeah, yeah, and it's definitely more. You're not you're not going out. I don't believe you're coming in. Yeah. So, so there's also, as Andrew quite rightly states, Dr. Gallimore, that there is there seems to be a an element of um, comedy to it. Yes. As if very jovial. It's like you know the, these entities are saying you have. Don't don't you get it? This this is this is real. <laughs> You've That's got no the idea. Yeah. And just 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 quickly coming back to the, so the DMT state. You come back. I come back. And generally, there's a there's a very sort of a horrible. I don't like the feeling because it's clean and very clear and cr- like crystal. Not cold, but not hot. And I come into my back into my body, and I can generally feel like um, it's like. Being a um, yeah, it's like being my consciousness is being put into a, uh, an android or some synthetic creature. Do you know that that is so interesting because of course the Gnostics believe that this is a creation of what they call the demiurge, right? Yaldabaoth, okay. and the idea is that there is a god who thinks he's god, using the term god as the creator of something, right. and that we live within this kind of we're trapped in matter. And we're trapped within this nastiness. Yeah. And there is a place behind which the Gnostics call the Pleroma, okay. which is this land, the place of purity, uh, which is exactly what you're seeming to be yeah. describing yeah, here. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yes. Whereas this is the Kenoma, and in my new book I discuss about entities that seem to pass over from the Pleroma into the Kenoma, right. into this, what we would call probably the Matrix simulation. Right. But I think your point is very good one there, you know, that this is somehow slightly grim slightly grimy in yeah some way. damp damp yeah. damp it's very damp kind of clammy so the, and even if my hands aren't damp and clammy i immediately feel wet as i'm coming that in it's intriguing i wonder what that is telling us is this part of the the, the the qualia of being here the you never actually realize that something is uncomfortable until you move away from it yeah exactly you know like dampness you don't necessarily you feel you're damp but it's only when you get into the warmth that you realise, yeah. and could this be that's what happens when we, we, we take DMT or we go into altered states of consciousness, when we lucid dream, yeah. when we have out of the body experiences, because I think they're all related, I think yeah. the whole overall thing. Yeah. I've been doing a lot of lucid dreaming recently, just from listening to the, you can download the stuff or listen to it on YouTube, and I put that on sometimes to go to sleep at night and the dreams are completely insane. Unfortunately, there's a new five year old young girl in my life at the moment and in the bedroom next door that seems to be affecting her at the same time so we're about to stop stop playing it yeah really yeah so her dreams have started to get a bit lucid as well wow but um yeah that was unusual it was almost like unlocking a door so I've played it for a couple of weeks over and over and nothing really happened then bang all of a sudden it happened and now any bit of meditation music or the slightest bit of lucid dream stuff boom so it shows that your brain is getting is is, more accustomed into it yeah because i've i've only ever become lucid once in a dream right and it was the most uncanny i've i I still find it extraordinary now because i was in the dream i'm in a nightclub so i'm in a nightclub and i come out the nightclub in the dream 
And as I come out, I walk out through the doors of the night, and I'm standing outside, and suddenly I realised I was lying in bed at the right. same time. And I go, if I'm in a street outside a nightclub and I'm lying in bed, I must be dreaming. And it was this kind of little light went on, I thought, yeah. I'm dreaming. And then I thought, what do I need to do now? So I thought, I know, I'll fly. So I, I tried to, I lift my legs up and I fell to the floor. And then I picked my legs up again. I've suddenly found myself rising up and I rise up down a, a, the, 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 the alleyway behind the nightclub. And there was a, a wall at the back and I flew over the wall and suddenly I'm flying and there's this beautiful bay, water, a bay, you know, like the sea. Yeah. And it's late at night, it's dark, and I could see cars going along the esplanade of the bay and the, the headlights. Right. And I could feel the wind around me. And, and then I lost it. Yeah. And then I came back into my body. But I know that that reality, that was a real place. Right. I don't for one minute disbelieve that that wasn't a real place. And that was one of the strangest experiences of my life. And I suddenly realized that when you guys and my friends talk about lucid dreams and out of the body experiences, they are real. Mm. You know, extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. Well, yeah, I wouldn't argue that point from doing the DMT to doing lucid dreaming. I mean, you can't, the, the dreams I've had, I mean, basically it's just like, oh, hello, I'm in a dream and I know I'm in a dream and that means I can do whatever I want in this dream. Yeah. And yeah. you can kind of construct how you want that to go. Like and you can would. you do that? You can construct it? Yeah, I mean, it's within not. Certain extremes. Yeah, I mean, off on a stupid tangent, but it, I found, found myself on a rooftop with a vampire for some reason. And, as you do. And the vampire ran off across, like, a bit like Twilight, jumping across all these roofs, and I went, oh, well, I can do that and just followed it running across all, you know, doing these massive jumps, climbing up walls, and it was quite humorous because I thought, well, I'm in, a I'm in a dream, and I know I can do this stuff, but, and, and I'm just doing it out of pure enjoyment and fun, rather than going, oh, well, maybe I should try something a little bit serious. I didn't, I just went with whatever was happening in the dream and just followed it along with, oh, I'm in a dream, so I can do whatever I want to do, sort of thing. Because this reminds me very much, you know, that you know, it's not off on a tangent because it's quite important, but, you know, the American film the filmmaker, uh, Richard Linklater, and I don't know if you've ever seen his, his movie, Waking Life. Right, no. Waking Life is fascinating. He also did a series of, I think it was before sunset and before dawn, there was a whole series of films he made. But in Waking Life, the central character is somebody who knows he's lucid dreaming and he wants, he wants to get back to being in normal reality. And he discusses with lots of talking heads in the movie. And it's very, very cleverly done. And it brings up some great philosophical questions of what's the nature of perception? Because really, everything that we perceive is being created by our brains. There, is stimu there are stimuli around us, so there's light coming in and the sound coming in, we can hear the trees and everything, but that is then being transferred into our brains and then being recreated as a facsimile of what we believe is external reality, somewhere in the deepest part of our brain and then presented to whatever consciousness is. Uh -huh. But whether what is really out there is any, in any way any more real than a lucid dream, because of course a lucid dream is your brain creating a three-dimensional reality. Yeah. Now, for instance, Charles McCrory and Celia Green came up with a model many years ago called a metachoric model. And the metachoric model of even reality is that this is, this is something we are creating. We are expanding it outwards all the time. Mm -hmm. And all that happens is, is with DMT, it just it stops that relationship and it just brings you into another reality that somehow abuts this one. Yeah. And it takes you into that. Or it opens, well, shamanic, it's like shamanic travelling, isn't it? Opens up that. So the way I always look at it is you, you're kind of retuning your, your perception yeah. receivers or whatever it is in your brain. You're retuning them to a different frequency. That's why, literally, if you do it, you could stand here and even though you know this is a wood, it will not look like a wood and it will transform into something completely different. Yes. So you're kind of like, that stuff's always there, but what you're doing is you're just realigning that signal to a different spot and everything just changes around you. And importantly here, you know, Thomas Nagel wrote a paper many years ago in 1973 called What It's Like to Be a Bat. And I've taken that concept in my writing to say, how do we know what is out there is, is, is a real one-to-one -one relationship with what, which, what is really out there. And we have this, va this, this vanity about ourselves and we think what I'm seeing is really out there. But of course, the way our eyes perceive light 
we receive a very, very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And in one of my, in one of my books, I came with an analogy, I was really pleased, it took me ages to actually get this correct. But I said, imagine that the electromagnetic spectrum from um, uh, radio waves to gamma rays is the Mississippi River, mm -hmm. starting in a little lake up in Minnesota and all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. The part that we see of the electromagnetic spectrum that we believe is everything and it is a correct facsimile of what reality is out there is about an inch and a half, about eight miles south of Hannibal, Missouri. Right. The rest of it we cannot perceive. Okay. Doesn't mean it's not real, no. but it's, we just don't perceive it. That's and I call this electromagnetic chauvinism. <laughs> now, in what it's like to be a bat, Nagel says, it, we can never imagine how a bat sees the world because it uses a form of sonar. And it, it uses sonar in such a way that it, we believe that it gives it a visual image using sound. Right. Now, how can we ever understand? But the, the, but the bat's version of reality is no more correct than ours is. You know? yeah. um, so the question is, what, what really is out there? What, what, what it, really is reality? And of course, David Bohm argued that reality outside, as I mentioned before, is a hologram. But Carl Pribram, who was a, a, a scientist, a psychologist at Uni Georgetown University, he came from a different viewpoint, and he considered that the brain works holographically. Because remember I was discussing before about the binding problem where everything comes together yeah. in the brain. If the brain works holographically, it works non-locally, which means it doesn't need to have a place where it all comes together because everything in the brain communicates instantaneously. Uh -huh. So in which case memory is nowhere in the brain and everywhere. It's, tr it's transformed all over the brain. Okay. So the brain is a hologram. So then we get the question, Bohm and Pribram came together and started talking about this. So we have a hologram processing a hologram. So suddenly it gets very, very strange. Yeah. You know, suddenly you've got this real, what is really reality? What is the relationship between consciousness and what is externally out there? The twin slit experiment, for instance, they know that if you, if you put a, mo um, a measuring device, you know, the, the, without going to the twin slits, it's quite, it's quite mysterious. But effectively, the subatomic particles change their behavior if they know they're being watched. Yeah. If you put a, um, a measuring device on one of the two slits, <coughs> a subatomic particle will go through one of the slit or the other. If there's no measuring device, it goes through both. I think I've read somewhere as well, as if you decide that you're going to measure it afterwards, it knows prior to you delayed deciding. Choice. Yeah. Delayed choice experiment. Yeah. yeah, the delayed choice is even more intriguing because uh, a guy called John Wheeler, one of the top quantum physicists, used the delayed choice idea to actually show that not only do we bring into reality by the act of observation the world we're seeing now, but we also bring into reality what happened billions of years ago. And he uses the idea of looking at a quasar, right. you know, which could have, could have been blown up, disappeared 10, 11 billion years ago. There's something called gravitational lensing. So if light comes along and there's a, 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 a galaxy or something, the light is bent it's split and bent around the galaxy, okay. which means if you look at a distant quasar, you'll see something called an Einstein cross, which is you will see two or four images, and it looks like four stars, but in fact it's just one, but the light's been bent. Okay. They said you could do a twin slit experiment looking at that, and you could, by your act of observation now, affect the choice of which way round the galaxy <coughs> the light went billions of years ago. Right. Which means not only do we bring into reality now, but for the whole of history we're bringing it into reality. Didn't the Incas have that the format about time was the past can affect the present, the present can affect the future, the future can affect the past. So time was just one big thing anyway. Well, that's it. I wrote a book called The Labyrinth of Time a few years ago. And in this I discussed the philosophy and the science of time. As St. Augustine said, <coughs> I think I understand time until I start to think about it. And then... I get completely confused and I felt this, you know, 380 pages later, I still didn't understand what time was because it's something we take for granted, but it seems to be the thing that everything happens within. But as Philip K. Dick said, can you imagine a time, you know, there's linear, well, there's two things. The first thing is how strange time is. We think that time flows, but a moment's reflection, if something is flowing, it needs something to be flowing against. You see a river flowing because there's a river bank. Mm -hmm. So there must be another form of time we measure time against. Okay. And J.W. Dunn, 
uh, in his book An Experiment with Time in the 1928-29 came up with this idea and said there are different types of time. <laughs> but there's also, as Philip K. Dick said, there could be orthogonal time, which is a time that runs at right angles to this time. So, you know, we're flowing like this, okay. but there is a time that goes like that, which is timeless. Okay. And That's it's quite a concept to try and grasp. There, absolutely. You know, and it's the idea of, <coughs> is there a part of our consciousness that exists in that orthogonal time? I suppose you can relate that back to then the DMT again, which is the fact that when you go in there, you can literally be 5, 10, 15 minutes, and it can seem like a lifetime. Yes. And, that, and that's a very strange concept to come out because one of the first questions you ask, or I always ask is when I come out, is like, how long was that? And you're expecting to hear 15 minutes and it's like, what, five minutes? And you're like, what? That was a really it. long one this time. But this isn't it. Time, uh, the, the, uh, Henri Bergson, it was Henri Bergson, said there's two forms of time, long and durée. And there's psychological time, which is the time we carry within ourselves. And there's clock time, but they're different things. Right. And of course, if you look at clock time, clock time isn't measuring time. It's measuring some, a clock, something going round a, a circle. Mm. It's not time, it's distance. So time yeah. itself is a mental construct. And depending upon how we feel depends on how quickly time, time travels, yeah. as it were. You know, we've all been in incidents where you've got bad news or you've you're fallen or you're in a car crash. Time seems to slow down. Yeah. Now that's to do with the release of particular neurotransmitters <coughs> in the brain, Excuse me. like glutamate. Okay. Because glutamate is very similar to ketamine, mm -hmm. in the sense that they seem to slow down our perception of time. And I think the same thing is with DMT. Yeah. It puts you into this timeless place, where suddenly time, you realise that time is not what it seems. And I think that's what happens when we die. Uh, when we die, we move into orthogonal time. We move into the time behind our time. Uh, yeah. And in doing so, we can live our lives again, and again, and again, and again. It's like Groundhog Life. Yeah. Groundhog Day, Groundhog Life. And the reason that we recognize certain sets of circumstances like deja vu, or we have precognitions, this is because we've lived this before. We've had this conversation before. We've had this conversation many, many times. Yeah. Different days, we made different decisions, the weather was slightly different. But One of us fell over into a puddle. Absolutely, <laughs> which we've oh, yeah. nearly done a few times. <laughs> Yes, okay. Yeah. So, but your concept of time there is a fascinating one. So you find that when you are experiencing DMT, you have no idea of how long you've been away. I think it's a, it's a, a massive time, thing. Everybody is the yeah, same on that one. it's kind of, for me, it's kind of when you enter that space, as you go, in, it's so difficult to explain, but as you go, or as I go into that space, maybe I'm thinking, you know, um, I, I'm, I've got, worries about possibly how the experience is going to turn out etc etc then as soon as you move into that space the concept of time just vanishes it, it's not like you're thinking i wonder how long it's been there is no time yes yeah. there is no time there is no and in fact there's not a lot of you left actually at that point but time definitely is it's not like you, you're able to think, God, this has been ages. I mean, obviously, once you start to come you start out of the back, you start to think that. And, you're, and you start to put yourself back together, yeah. then all of a sudden you'll get a little, um, well, I wonder how long that was. But that's kind of right at the surface. You've been down in the Mariana Trench, and now you're just yeah. a metre from the surface, and then the concept of time comes back. Oh, yeah, I've just done DMT. Yeah, that's what exactly. you're yeah. Exactly. That's what... Oh, DMT, that's what, oh my God, how long was that? Yeah, because again, really this, this is quite, again, quite intriguing because um, many years ago, not many years ago, about 15 years ago, a guy called Julian Barber wrote a book called The End of Time. Okay. And Barber is a mathematician and he again discusses the fact, the way in which it's human consciousness that, that, and perception that puts time in a, in a linear format. But real time, the, it's timeless. And he, call, it's, he calls the timeless place Platonia because it's the place of the platonic forms, oh, you know, okay. from Plato and yeah. philosophy, that, that everything that here is a facsimile of something that is the real, you know, like that there's a facsimile, there's all these trees are facsimiles of the real tree, which is a platonic form that exists in the pleroma, exists in the place outside of ourselves. And he argues that we perceive time because that's how our brains are processed to do. Our brains are one of the things that creates the time around us. But time stops at certain times. And again, I would argue, you know, that it's when you are in altered states of consciousness that time, and that's the big clue, isn't it? 
you know, that we feel, for instance, we see people die, but from their point of view, they don't die. It's only in our time, yeah. our time perception, okay, they yeah. go. But when they start to die, I think something very strange happens in the brain and they, their time just stretches. So the final seconds of their life can stretch for a whole lifetime. And at the end of that second life, a whole lifetime. You know, it's the idea of, you know, the analogy of, for instance, you imagine a, a frog in the middle of a pond and the, the pond is six foot wide and the, the frog's on a lily. And it's a strange frog because when it jumps, the first jump is a foot, second jump is six inches, the next one is three inches, one and a half inches. You can quickly calculate that the frog will never actually never get, get to the, the end. end. And I think this is what happens with death. Right. Within your own subjective time, you never get there. But for other people, you die. It's called Zeno's bisection paradox mathematically. Right. But it's an intriguing point that I think in my first book I could prove that none of us actually die. And again, if anybody's interested in this, there's a guy called Max Tegmark at Princeton University who's a Swedish-American quantum physical cosmologist, and he does something called a quantum suicide experiment. Sorry. Okay. Let's get rid of that. Turn that down. Quantum suicide experiment. The quantum experiment. suicide experiment. And again, if you get the opportunity, just go on YouTube and put quantum suicide in. And it's again applying the Schrodinger, Schrodinger's cat and the principles of Schrodinger's cat and the observer idea that we are all observers and creating our own universes. He then extrapolates from that and says, you can, sh you can prove that from the viewpoint of the observer, they can never die. Right. And it's to do with the idea of somebody standing in front of a submachine gun and there is a one in six, or no, well, probably a revolver, and there's a one in six chance of the, the it was one bullet, six holes. Russian and, roulette. Like Russian roulette. And he said that you can prove that if you play Russian roulette, however many times you play, you will never be shot. But your assistant or people around you will see click, 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 bang, and they'll see you die. <laughs> it's really clever. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a straightforward analysis and application of what we understand about quantum physics. Now, if this is true, this means that we are all, in effect, immortal. Mm. It's just that other people see us die. That was it, yeah. Okay. Mm. From everybody that. else's perspective. It kind of ties in nicely with the double slit observer. Yeah, you need is the, the cat you need dead the or alive. You to, yeah. You need the observer. The different. The result is different to the observer than to this this source of the observed. Yes. Well, this is the thing about Everett's many worlds interpretation, isn't it? And Ever when Hugh Everett III wrote his PhD thesis in 1957. He was trying to explain Schrodinger's cat, how it can be both alive and dead at the same time. And he came up with a solution that when the box is opened, the wave function continues, and there's one scientist who observes a dead cat, <laughs> and one yeah. scientist who observes a live cat, yeah. and it splits. Yeah, right. Now, initially that was thought, oh, nonsensical, but more and more quantum physicists are coming around to this, and there's one very good reason why they're coming around to this. It's because if this was the only universe there's ever been, it got it right first time, every time, for sentient beings to evolve as we have done. Because even from the first billionth of the, of the, the, the moments after the Big Bang, the balance between matter and antimatter, there was slightly more matter than antimatter. Mm. If it had been equal, the universe would never have started. And then there's a whole series of these things, it's called the Goldilocks enigma, as to why it is that this universe is right. However, if there are billions of universes, we just happen to exist in the one that was right for us. Yeah. So there, might, there might be others that that universe works in a completely different yes. way, and those species or entities that are living in there, they might be in the DMT realm, but that's another question. And there's the question, you know, do we, when we go into the DMT realm, go into elements of the multiverse or overlapping areas of the multiverse? Yeah. As people argue, you know, when you go into, the, into DMT, you're going into the shamanic realm, you're going into the liminal states between the upper world and the lower world and you can interface with entities then that come through. See, for, for me, one thing there, so for me, certainly within the DMT, within the, within, within the DMT state, it feels like they and that space is aware of us, uh. but we aren't aware of it until we're in its space. It's kind of not like a, it doesn't feel like a cross section of strangers. It feels like we are being observed by that space and by the entities that reside in that space. Once you get there, it's like they are, they're waiting for you, they, they are familiar with you, they know you, 
Um, do you know what I mean? Yeah, so a hierarchy kind of, of awareness. It's like a hot. Yeah, it's kind of. And, and, and again, I draw back to, to to Dr. Gallimore, where he's his theory that perhaps we are a tiny slice of. Uh, a much larger information structure, yeah. a bit like the two-dimensional uh, beings that, if a three-dimensional ball was put into their reality, they would see dot getting, the dot bigger, and getting bigger. bigger and bigger and bigger, yeah. um, and we would be aware of <coughs> them. But they, yeah. So, but they can't be aware of that three-dimensional space. It feels like the DMT state space is a multi-dimensional space that is aware of this three-dimensional space, but we aren't aware of it until we're in its presence, yes. if that makes sense. So, yeah, so it's... That's it's, a fascinating point, yes. It's it very is, interesting. The idea that we are restricted, our perceptions are restricted here, which comes down again to the whole idea of the brain as an attenuator, that uh -huh. the brain takes information out in order for us to survive within yes. this, for yeah. want of a better term, simulation. Yeah, you know, yeah. Henri Bergson, C.D. Broad, um, Aldous Huxley, they all said that the brain does that. Mm. And I did hear, um, and I need to find the paper at the moment, that research at the University of Sussex has recently, they did a series of experiments with people taking psilocybin. Yes. And that they discovered that psilocybin, counter to what they believed, actually shut parts of the brain down yeah. to yeah, actually yeah. stop the brain being an attenuator. Yeah, so that it can it can open up, so it opens uh, up channels doors of, of But a simple bit of proof to what you just said is that all the time that you were just talking there, I didn't hear the wind, I didn't hear the birds. Yeah. Yeah. It was completely it's... shut out because I'm focusing on what you're saying. So there is the the attenuator. It's literally shutting down stuff I don't need to know about right there and then. Mm. Yeah, and exactly. in, in my book, Opening the Doors of <coughs> Perception, this is what I discuss that people who have autism, people have temporal lobe epilepsy, migraine, uh, Asperger's syndrome, um, um, dementia. What's happening there is the brain's ability to cut out the additional information gets lost. And this is why children oh, who have autism, they have something uh, that is known as the, um, the, 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 the loud world syndrome. The idea that they hear noises that we don't hear and everything crowds in and distresses them. Yeah. Uh, Markham, I think, was the person that came up with that idea after observing his own son. And this is true, you know, you watch, I worked locally, there is a, a school for autistic children, and I worked there for a year on a business contract. And the stories I was told by the people who looked after these children were extraordinary. These children, there were, there were mathematical savants, there were children that knew the date, the time of the day, even though they didn't have clocks or watches, that they were telepathic, that, that, that they were precognitive, there were so many incidents of this taking place on a regular basis and this is because those children those children their doors of perception are more open mm. now i believe that again certain individuals have this skill and i think that probably entheogens such as dmt 5-meo dmt also facilitate that again seems to stop the brain being an attenuator yeah yeah p doesn't work in my everyday life <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get that with the autistic kids because it's, it's almost like uh, if you're if you're functioning correctly in this reality, then you know if that if that if that um, if that is skewed, then why wouldn't your senses be highlighted yeah. in other areas? It's and of course, then you do have you know, for instance, I was told that my almost namesake Kim Peak, who was the guy that Rain Man was based upon. Uh -huh. um, I, did a, um, I wrote about some of the things that Kim Peak could do a few years ago and also spoke to the, the doctor who worked with him. And in fact, this doctor was one of the advisors on the, the, the Rain Man movie. And he was saying that Kim Peak, when they used to be traveling, when he was on tour, he'd get bored and he used to go in and he'd go into the hotel room and he'd take out the hotel telephone directory and he'd add up all the telephone numbers each page and he was never wrong he could actually you could take a book and he could mirror read okay. and he could tell you the location of any word in any book but he couldn't tie his own shoelaces yeah that's amazing isn't it you know and it's the kind of these focused skills you know like there were kids at the home you know that you could turn around and they'd say what date were you born and you'd tell them to say Tuesday like that and they were always right so there's something there going on with the brain. The brain is open 
And I think, again, it's to do with the holographic nature of the brain. These children are able to link parts of their memory and pull them out. Because I, I, I have certain elements that I can do that. I don't have to think about where I've read something. It just instantaneously comes into my mind. And sometimes I'll say things when I'm doing interviews and I'll go, I don't even know where I know that from. And I'll go and check it up and I'll be right. And I think, but Jesus, you know, how did I know that? Mm. Um, and it just seems that the brain can communicate. And I think there's a reason for this. I think it's to do with the glial cells in the brain. You know the way people turn around and say 10% of your brain is missing? You heard that phrase, you know, we only we use 10% of our brain. Which isn't tr entirely true, is it? Well, it's not. But the interesting thing is, the reason where that came from is that 10% of the brain are neurons. Right. 90% of the brain are made of something called glial cells. Okay. And glial cells, they didn't know what glial cells were for. Uh, in fact, they were so dismissed, the word glial is German for glue. Because the idea was the glial cells were there to just hold the neurons in place. But they have recently right. discovered that glial cells, again, seem to be able to communicate non-locally. Okay. Again, they don't need to need chemical communications through neurotransmitters, which the, the neurons do. Glial cells seem to be able to just instantaneously across the brain communicate with other glial cells. So again, we have again non-locality, yeah. and we have again the idea is at a deeper level, the David Bohm hologram, yeah. the brain working holographically. And I think there's an awful lot of research that needs to be done in this area. Is that like is that theory of Rupert Sheldrake? Amorphic Resi resonance. Amorphic, amorphic resonance. resonance yeah. Is that kind of like the same thing? Very they're similar. Just, they're basically able to communicate, but without, without the, any contact. Correct. And again, non-locality, that's exactly what non-locality is. Mm. You know, non-locality was originally came up, I think it was 1937, that um, Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen got together to write a paper to try to disprove the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics about... Um, the observer effect again okay. and they argued that if you entangle two particles um, and you, you spread them apart at a great distance if you did one to one the other one would react instantaneously uh, Einstein said that would be impossible because it would contravene the speed of light and the tra transfer of information in 1964 an Irish scientist called John Bell at CERN wrote a paper and mathematically showed that Einstein was wrong and in 1981 a guy called Alain Aspect at the University of Paris and a guy called Dalibard did a series of experiments with lasers and they actually discovered that non-locality is real. So if you do something one particle, the other one instantaneously reacts. And now, research has now been done. I mean, there's a guy, Anton Zeilinger at the University <coughs> of Vienna. He's now been doing it across vast distances. Right. So non-locality is real. And I think, is it, did you, I might have heard you say something and it might not be even, it doesn't even, Count with time either, so that's right. So you know, going back to that, the going light back transfer. To, yeah, it, it's it clearly time <coughs> is non-locality in terms of time as well, and, and non-locality communication across time. What is it all about? Exactly. <laughs>